Hello, welcome to Journal of a Medical Intuitive. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Lisa Vest, and we're listening to a little music by Flower Productions. Um, it's a musical uh, orchestral version of the coronavirus. What the virus would sound like. Uh, very interesting. And it fits the topic today because I'm talking about the coronavirus again today. And my most recent download, uh, I was actually able to speak to the coronavirus as a being and ask him some questions. He came through as a masculine energy. And so I'm going to talk about some of the answers I got from the coronavirus today. And I want to say first, you know, as a medical intuitive, this isn't the first virus that I've spoken to. Um, One of the ways that I work as a medical intuitive is that I can talk to different parts of the body to get information about the illness that the person is dealing with. And so sometimes I might talk to a liver or a kidney or the heart, or sometimes I'll speak to a microorganism like a bacteria or a virus in the body and ask them questions like, you know, why are you here? What do you want? Uh, is there a message you have for the person? Uh, is that why, you know, you're here? And so I, I was able to go up to the Akashic Records and have a conversation with the coronavirus. And I had a lot of questions. And, you know, one of my first um, questions was about... You know, you know, I just try to ask the questions that I thought we all have about the virus. Um, and one of the first things that the virus told me was that it's growing over time and that the virus that we have today is not the virus we had a week ago. And that the virus is growing, it's getting, gaining strength, and it's feeding off of the planet. Um, and getting strength and getting bigger and bigger. Um, Now, I know that's not good news, but, um, you know, it is what it is. So I'm getting, you know, I'm getting different information from the coronavirus. Some of it is uplifting. Some of it is, um, you know, difficult to hear. And, but I've been told by my guides that I'm supposed to provide these messages. I'm supposed to pass this information on. Um, And so that's what I'm doing, is passing it on. And so the first thing that that he said was that he's growing. And um, and so I asked, well, how do you operate? Um, You know, what can people do? How do we survive you? What do we need to know? And... um, you know, one of the things I said is, well, your intention isn't to, you know, like kill everybody, right? Because, you know, you want to stay alive. And, and you know, the virus said, yeah, they need hosts, uh, you know. So he's not trying to kill people off. That's really not his intention. Um, and so um, I asked about that, about, you know, why some people are dying and, and you know, what the, what the kind of the purpose or the intention of the virus is. And um, one of the things that the virus said was that he is very fast-moving and very adaptable. Um, And the way that he's getting stronger is by the people who get infected and don't develop symptoms. Um, What the coronavirus said is that they're going to be hosts in the future. And so those are the ideal hosts for the coronavirus because the coronavirus can come back to that person and infect them again and again and again. And so the ones that are dying now are the ones that can't tolerate the coronavirus in its current form. And the ones that are going to die in the future are the ones that um, were strong enough to tolerate the current form but won't be able to tolerate the mutation that happens in a few weeks or a few months. Um, now the stronger the coronavirus gets, the fewer people survive. And what the virus said is that he's changing. And so he's changing form again and again so that he can affect different populations at different times and keep moving over the planet in a wave. 
so he's mutating. Um, if the virus were to infect everybody at once um, and, you know, kill everybody, then the virus would lose all his hosts and uh, that wouldn't serve his purpose. And so what the way it works is there's this continuous adaptation. The virus keeps moving, keeps moving, and as it moves over different territory, different regions of the earth, it changes form to adapt to the new territory. And so there are certain territories that cer where certain versions of the coronavirus don't survive well. And so in order to be in those areas, the coronavirus has to mutate to a different form to adapt to the environment. Also, the virus reaches a certain saturation point in a community, and then it has to move to another community to find new hosts. And so that's why um, there's going to be so much movement with this virus. Movement is really key to this virus. The virus relies really heavily on excessive movement. It's a very fast-moving virus. Um, and if you were to compare this virus to other viruses in a race, the coronavirus 19 would be much faster than other viruses. That means it moves through populations more quickly and it moves out of populations more quickly than other viruses. It doesn't hang around the way other viruses might hang around all winter, like the influenza. Coronavirus doesn't do that. Uh, it keeps it moving, keeps it moving. Um, it has a totally different way of operating. And so I asked the coronavirus, well, what is our defense against you? How do we protect ourselves from you? And he said, change, change, you have to change. I'm an agent of change. That's my purpose. I am an agent of change. And so what I bring is I bring change. And it's up to the light workers to decide whether or not they're going to take advantage of this opportunity to change things for the better. There are others who might take advantage of this to change things for the worse. But all I am is a doorway and a portal to change. And the coronavirus said, I'm neutral. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a good guy. I'm just a virus guy who's doing my thing, coming to live my life. And I'm providing an opportunity to change. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and so I asked, uh, okay, but how do we survive you? Um, and one of the things that he said was that if too many of you survive, then you won't change. And if too many of you die, then there won't be, there might not be enough of you left to change. So there has to be a kind of moderation, a, a moderate number of people who don't survive. And so I asked the hard question that people are wondering, you know, uh, is there a number you can give me for how many? And the answer was 5 million worldwide. Um, and so he said, five, mil if 5 million people died worldwide, that would be enough to change things in a major way. But that if 25 million people died, that would be too much to change things. That things would then fall apart and that then change would be difficult and it would take a lot longer uh, for people to change if that many people died. Um, but kept, he just kept reiterating that my purpose is change and we could have change happen fast or we can have change happen slow. Um, and so I said, well, what else do we need to know about how this virus operates? Um, you know, and, and our, you know, is there something different we could be doing from what we're doing now? You know, we're currently isolating disinfecting, um, doing everything we can to um, flatten the curve. And one of the things that he said was that, the, you know, the virus is very sticky. Um, he said, I'm very sticky. I stick to everything kind of like glue. I'm stickier than other viruses that you're familiar with. Um, I don't just stick to surfaces. I stick to people. I stay stuck to people for a long time. I stay stuck to surfaces for a long time. And so I asked, well, how long are people contagious? And the coronavirus said months. So people can be sick with this for three months and they can be contagious pretty much the whole time. Not really the whole time because there are days where the illness comes and goes in waves and the person gets sicker and then gets better and then gets sicker. And so they're not as contagious the whole time. Um, 
But what was interesting, something that the virus said that didn't really make sense to me, and I kind of questioned him on it, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it anyway because, um, you know, I'm just a messenger, and, and I'm hoping this is, is going to be helpful for people. But he said that um, people are actually more contagious when they're less sick. And so that when they're less sick, they're moving around a lot more, they're touching everything, and they're spreading it everywhere. Um, and also because when a person is very, very sick, the virus is super focused at that point on the cells of the body of the host and is less interested at that point in spreading. Um, whereas when the person is in a period of remission or... Um, asymptomatic or has, you know, light symptoms, then the virus is looking to move around and interact with more, uh, is looking for more hosts. And so here you have, you know, the perfect storm of the virus is seeking out new hosts. And at the same time, the person is like, oh, I don't feel so bad. I'm going to go out. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And, and then they start spreading it everywhere and giving the virus all of these opportunities to jump onto other hosts, other surfaces. And so um, it has to do with the stickiness of the virus, that there's something about the stickiness of the virus that changes depending upon how advanced the illness is in the body. Um, and so... I, you know, I said to the virus, this seems counterintuitive. We tend to think of people as very sick, as having the largest viral load and being the most contagious. They're coughing on people. They have body fluids in the hospital. They're, you know, aren't they the most contagious people, the people who are really sick? Um, and, and the virus said, no, that, um, that if people are getting sick because they're around people who are super sick, it's not because they're getting spit on by the sick person. It's actually because uh, the sick person has already spread the virus on all of their belongings, on their bed, in the entire room. And it's actually all of that that's making people sick. And so what would be helpful is to decontaminate everything associated with a sick person, all of their belongings, their room, their bed, you know, everything, the air around them. If that could all be decontaminated, then you would not see a lot of people getting sick by being in the room with a sick person. Um, you're more, much more likely to see people getting sick, say, in you know the emergency room or the waiting room or at home uh, where somebody is sick and has a lot of people visiting them. Um, and again, reiterating that the virus is stickier when it's outside of the body um, than when it's inside of the body. Um, and so one of the things that he emphasizes is that the virus is capable of spreading to more people without a host than with a host. And so um, it's actually the virus that's on all of the surfaces that is spreading uh, to other people. It's not actually being spread from person to person nearly as much as it's being spread from objects to persons. Um, and so the virus doesn't need the host to spread. Uh, once the host has gone everywhere and, and touched everything and breathed in everything, then um, the virus is out there doing its thing and uh, doesn't need the host anymore. So I asked about if there were any certain, you know, or if there were any conditions that make some people to get, some people more likely to get sick than other people. And the virus said it had to do with the type of cells, that it had to do with the cell shape. That I guess there are distinctions between cell shapes between persons. And when I asked if there was a medical term for that, um, all that I was told was that it's, it's somewhat similar to sickle cell disease where the blood vessels have a different shape to them and then that affects uh, all kinds of other things um, in the body. And so there's some type of characteristic like that um, 
where one person's cells have a different shape to another person's cells and that predisposes them to um, be more likely to develop illness when they get the virus. Now they, you know, he did reiterate what was shared earlier um, about bullying and um, vulnerability that people who are being bullied or who have been bullied, who are oppressed or have been oppressed are also more vulnerable to the virus, but also that the bullies are also vulnerable or they will be uh, eventually, maybe not right now, but uh, in a later version of it. Um, and so, you know, one of the things the virus said is the reason that the virus is more spread, more widespread in densely populated areas, like in places like New York or in inner cities, is because everybody is sharing the same objects. They're sharing the same spaces, um, the same bathrooms, the same hallways, the same alleyways. Um, and so there are a lot more opportunities for the virus to jump from objects uh, or air onto hosts in these densely populated areas. And there are a lot more people just spreading the virus around just by touching everything and breathing. Um, and there are, there are also um, certain places which are really hospitable to the virus. Um, inside is more hospitable than outside, um, although it can be proliferated outside too. Uh, but places that are moist without being too hot, warm, moist places help to proliferate the virus. So uh, bathrooms and kitchens and swimming pools and saunas and gyms, locker rooms, yoga studios, massage studios, places where there's perspiration, where it's warm and cozy, or where some effort has been made to keep the air uh, circulating or keep the air contained or modulated. So if there's no open windows, open doors, and the air is being circulated, air conditioning, heat, uh, things like that, is and it also makes a, for a very hospitable environment for the virus. Um, there was kind of an interesting thing that he said about behaviors. I asked if there was any behaviors we could engage in that would protect us apart from what we're already doing. And he mentioned something interesting about chemicals. Um, he said that, you know, there are some people that wear a lot of chemicals, you know, kind of unnatural things on their skin, like makeup and uh, different chemicals in their hair. And actually it's harder for the virus to attach to all those chemicals. And so what you're gonna see is that people who have a lot of really unhealthy toiletries um, are actually less likely to pick up um, as much of the virus as people who are wearing more natural things. And so that there's, there's gonna be a tendency, a temporary tendency for people to move in the direction of chemicals like, you know, all these decontamination chemicals, bleach and, you know, all these harsh chemicals and people are gonna tend in that direction like with the hand sanitizer and uh, different things because it works. Um, but this is, uh, a stage in the development and there is one thing that's not a harsh chemical that helps and that's oil and now I'm not a licensed physician and I don't recommend that anyone uh, take anything I say and use it to go against what their doctors are telling them uh, so I'm just I'm just passing on some of this information but you know please proceed with caution um, so you know, he said that oil was also something that could actually be used to clean, um, that the virus can be broken up with oil. And so people could put oil on their hair and their skin, or they could use oil to clean surfaces. Um, you know, so I don't, you know, I don't know if that, um, it makes sense scientifically and so you know hopefully there'll be some science to come out to let us know whether or not using solutions with oil in them are effective against the virus so I asked about all these people who are suffering um, you know there's a lot of people suffering some are suffering from the pandemic and others are suffering from 
um, the effects of the pandemic, like not having money for food, uh, not being able to pay their rent, uh, domestic violence, all kinds of things are happening. And my guide said, I said, what can we do to alleviate the suffering? And they said, you can feed them. You can feed everybody. Everybody could be fed. This is bringing attention uh, to the fact that there are people who need to be fed. And there's all this food being wasted. And all of the food that's being wasted could be given to the hungry. And there could be a complete redistribution of food. And this would change the whole paradigm around farming and agribusiness and food supply and distribution of food. There could be a whole paradigm shift in how everything is done in the food industry as a result of this big change brought on by the pandemic. And so if we're worried about the people who are suffering, we can help them, we can feed them, we can feed them all, and we can house them all, and we can free them all. We can put people in safe places and make sure they have safe food and water And if we do that for the whole planet, if we make sure everybody has food and water and a safe place to stay, that will protect all of us from the spread of the virus. And it will also have caused a shift in our understanding of our oneness and what it means when one person suffers, what it means for another person who is not suffering. The virus puts us all into connection because the virus is like a net that's spreading over the planet and it's connecting all of us to all of us. And so the virus is one being, if you look at it from afar, the whole planet is covered in one coronavirus and all the little microscopic viruses are just pieces of that grand virus. They're all parts of that whole. And when we get infected as individuals, then we are all connected by the network of the virus. And if we begin to see this, we will begin to understand how we are all connected. And that will help us to address the pandemic. Because if we can address everybody who is suffering, we will decrease the viability of the virus worldwide. So when we eliminate the conditions that make it thrive, the overcrowded housing and the poor hygiene and the insufficient food and water and the energy of oppression, the energy of bullying and harm and violence, When we eliminate those energies and we eliminate those practices and we change the environment, then the virus no longer proliferates. The solution is right in front of us and it's not that difficult. Taking care of all the people on the planet and making sure that everybody has food and water and a safe, clean place to live is actually easier to do than what countries are currently trying to do by isolating people and closing down everything and trying to defeat the virus that way. It's actually easier to do it this other way. It's actually easier and faster. The way that it's currently being addressed slows down the progression of the virus, flattens the curve, but it doesn't eliminate it. This other way of addressing it by feeding and clothing the planet and putting everybody in safe, clean housing and eliminating oppression and violence and fear eliminates the virus altogether. It eliminates the virus in all of its forms, all of its mutations and variations and versions, both in the present and in times to come. Because it eliminates the energetic matrix which birthed the virus. Once the energetic matrix which birthed the virus is destroyed, the physical matrix will also dissolve. And, you know, my response to that was to say, you know, people are going to think that's too hard. People are going to say, well, how can we eliminate hunger and homelessness and, and feed the whole planet and take care of the whole planet and end war and violence and rape? How can we do it? That's monumental. And the answer was, yes, this is a monumental event you are living through. And so it is going to take monumental change to address it. And they said it's not as difficult as it sounds because once people recognize the connection between these things and the proliferation of the virus, 
then they will be willing to make the changes. Right now, people are not aware of the connection. They're not seeing the connection between the oppression, the violence, the poverty, and the virus. They're not seeing the connection yet. They're not aware yet of how changing one changes the other. But as soon as people become aware of the connection, they will begin to get on board very quickly and start making these changes. And this could go on and on. This virus could circumnavigate the globe over and over and over again, mutating and changing and wreaking havoc and finding new hosts. This could go on and on. Or there could be a realization about the energetic cause, and then there could be a shift, and the behaviors could be changed, which could then eliminate the cause, and that would then eliminate the virus and the potentiality for future viruses. And when people see this, then people will change when they see this connection, this cause and effect connection, especially when they see how it affects the future, not just the present, then they will be willing to make these changes. And they were explaining that we're going to need everybody to work together for us to see this change, for us to see this cause and effect connection. It's going to be up to the scientists in large part. The scientists are going to have to come together and they're going to have to also come together with the activists and the healers and the artists. They're going to have to come together with the politicians, with the organizers of people, the social workers, the counselors. They're all going to have to come together. They can't work separately anymore. They're going to have to come together to figure this out and work together because their mission is one. They're going to have to find these links between the cause and the effect. They're going to have to find the links between addressing the hunger, the homelessness, the violence, and the eradication of the virus. And once they discover these links, once the scientists discover the links, once the, other, the others discover these links, they'll have to document them and provide evidence of the link and then educate and broadcast the knowledge to everyone. And once that work is done, people will see the connection. The changes might be incremental at first before everyone gets on board because people have to see it to believe it. And so it might start in one place where there'll be one place on the planet where this work is done. People are housed and fed and violence is eradicated and then that part of the world has no virus and nobody's getting sick. And then people see the connection and then they spread the word and the awareness spreads, and then it goes to another place. And this is similar to the way social distancing and its effectiveness has spread. People saw that when certain cities enforced social distancing early on, they were able to flatten the curve. And then once other cities and other states saw that, they decided to institute their own social distancing practices. But people had to see it. They had to see the proof. Um, and so when people see the proof, they will be willing to make the change and the understanding will spread. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Journal of a Medical Intuitive. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Lisa Vest. That's my most recent download from the coronavirus. Uh, Please remember to subscribe to my podcast on Podomatic so you can get updates on when the next episode will air. Uh, In my next episode, I'm going to address some of the science uh, that supports the messages I've been getting for the last six weeks from my guides. Uh, As the information is coming in, you know, I'm looking at the science, I'm looking at the medical studies coming out. And I'm looking to see uh, if there is evidence that the information I'm getting is accurate. You know, medical intuition is all about combining intuition with science. And so anything that I give as information, I always like to check it and make sure that there's some evidence that it's true. I encourage my listeners also to check everything that I say and to challenge me if anything I say is shown to be false. Uh, Thank you for listening, and today is April 29th, 2020.
Peace, safe.